Hello. Welcome to my channel. If you're new here, I have been living in my car since the spring of 2022, and I absolutely love it. Spoiler alert, I love it. I plan to do this for a while to come. I am happier than I have ever been. Yikes! Yeah. Right. I guess you're supposed to get dirty in this life, huh? <laughs> well, I'm wet and muddy, but that's not why living in a car is hard. <laughs> so on this channel, I create two different types of videos. I create adventuring videos where I take you along with me and show you beautiful places. And then the second type of video I create is where I talk all about car life, where I share about how I do things, how I organize, set up. So I make those two different types of content. If this is something you think you're interested in, definitely subscribe. So I want to talk about the hardest parts of living in the car because despite the fact that I absolutely love this, sometimes it's hard, you guys. Sometimes it is hard. And I will share of all things that I thought was going to be the hardest for me with living in a car, I didn't see it coming. It's climate control. One, lack of climate control. In a car, that is not a Prius or a Tesla, <laughs> you are at the mercy of the elements. The car is not built to be insulated to live in. So when it is hot, it becomes a fishbowl and it becomes hot. And when it is cold, seriously, burr. I met a lady when I was at Tiny Fest in December who said, I lived out of my car for like three years. And she said, that is what I always would tell people is I lived out of my car she says because you sleep in your car there's not much more you do in your car besides sleep and drive and i thought that is so perfect because one of the things that i love the most about this life is you live outside that is seriously why i love this lifestyle if outside is uncomfortably hot or unhealthily i don't know if that's a word it doesn't sound like it's a word but unhealthily cold then it kind of sucks. There's solutions for each of these things to an extent, but wow, did I not realize before living in my car, the gift that is insulation and the gift that is the ability to heat or cool a space. So in the summer when it's hot, there's at least five different ways to help yourself stay cool. One, you follow the weather. That's the beautiful thing about being a nomad is you can chase the weather. Two, window screens. Window screens are amazing. I have four for all four of my windows and when it's really hot, I just put those screens on all day. It keeps the bugs out, but it allows the air to flow in and out. Three. I then, on the windows that do not close, like the windshield and then the back window, I have either the sun shades or I'll put a towel on the outside of that window as seen here. Those are several ways that I keep the temperature of the car down because with the windows, it is sort of like a greenhouse effect. That sun comes in, the sun rays come in and it doesn't bounce back out. Which brings me to my next solution, which is ceramic window tint. Now, I did not tint my windows for the entire summer that I was in my car. I didn't tint them until about six months after I moved into my car. I did choose the ceramic, more expensive tint because apparently it does help with temperature control. Also, I use a fan. There are rechargeable fans that run on a battery. I also have a fan that runs from my Jackery Solar Power Station. If it's extra, extra hot, I have a spray bottle with just water that I spray on myself and then put the fan on, as seen here in the heat wave. So those are several different ways to keep cool. Sometimes it's just simply hot and uncomfortable. The hardest times for me to keep cool are when I'm working because the work that I do is confidential in nature. So if there's anyone potentially in an earshot around me, I don't work outside. So I'll work in my car to keep things 
confidential. Usually I have as many means to keep things cool up as possible. Sometimes it just gets really hot. So then when I'm on Zoom calls, I look like extra red in the face and I start sweating. Now, I've always been one prior to car life to far prefer the fall and winter over the spring and summer. I loved, notice that says past tense, loved cold weather. However, while living in a car, the winter has been far harder than the uncomfortable summer. I spent most of November and December in Flagstaff where it gets down to zero degrees in the mornings in Flagstaff. That will kill your power station. It's impossible to work in a healthy way in your vehicle. To live out of your vehicle, to clean up your vehicle, which you do every morning and to, to be outside, especially if it's snowing, it's just not doable. So what I ended up doing in December was take three different pet sitting gigs that totaled three weeks of the month of December. And that was the only healthy way to live in Flagstaff. Solutions for the cold when you do live in your car. I did buy a dual wattage space heater that can run on a power station. The space heater operates on two settings. One would be approximately 150 watts per hour and the other would be approximately 220 watts per hour. It does not heat your car. However, if it is absolutely freezing, it heats you just enough to take that biting cold edge off of things. I also have a neck warmer. I'm gonna show you that right here. I recommend this product. I have only had it for approximately a month now. I've been using it when I was pet sitting, not even being in my car because I really like it. I got mine from Home Depot. I will put a link to the product below. Not sponsored by them, I just like it. Now, I still can't speak for the longevity of this product. I don't know how long it's gonna last. All I know is it recharges. It only takes like six watts per hour to recharge on my power stations. It lasts for approximately four to six hours of nice, comfortable, warm heat. It's very soothing. I like it. I'd recommend it. And it did cost 40 bucks. So it's a little pricey, but it is what it is. I also use hot hands. Whenever it's really cold, I'll sleep with hot hands under all my blankets. And by all my blankets, I mean eight blankets plus a zero degree sleeping bag if needed. So I put my hot hands right under the blankets themselves and that's nice. My preference is the super warmer hot hands that are 18 hours and they're kind of like a larger pack. There are two types of heat that I've not used and one is anything that would require butane or propane. For me, I'm just too uncomfortable with the possibility of carbon monoxide poisoning. So I personally would not do that. Even I can't say I would recommend it. To me, that's just too high of a risk. I also got very temporarily excited about the clay pot heater idea that you use with a couple clay pots and a candle and I'm so grateful that I read and watched videos about people's experience of how quickly they set fire or blow up. I won't use those two forms of heat. In terms of climate and weather that will affect your life when you live in a car, rain, snow, and wind. Those elements matter. I've been stuck in snowstorms, rainstorms, and windstorms. Sometimes the windstorm is fun. I think it's kind of fun when you're in your car and it's shaking a little bit and it's super windy and you watch a bunch of stuff blow around but you're like nestled inside your vehicle. But the reality is you can't get out. You can't clean it very well. When you are trying to make your bed in the wind, you pull your blanket up and it just blows down. So that doesn't work. Plus, if you have tents, they could very well blow away. Now, in the Southwest, we've got some insane winds. So I'm not talking about a little breeziness. I'm talking about some pretty big wind storms. Just yesterday, there was no wind in the forecast. I had both of my tents up. I had to take them down in about 30 degree gusts. I came across this on my walk. I think that's beautiful. I bet you that Gregory James White loved this place. May his spirit rest in peace. That's where I was sitting. I was just sitting down there. The last thing I'll share about climate and weather that can be challenging when you're living in a car is that you can't control the cloudy days. The best you can do is chase the sunshine. 
but I've chased the sunshine. This is the first sunny day in three days. It's supposed to be partly cloudy the next two and then like a week of clouds again. To recharge your solar energy sources, kind of tricky when it's really cloudy. So that's really important to keep in mind, especially if you are a digital nomad and work from the road. Solutions that I have for that is maybe I need to go for a real long drive to charge with my 12 volt charging capability. Hi, future Autumn here. Just woke up. As I'm editing this video, I realized that I forgot to share one more solution about how to charge your power stations if you are caught in a bunch of back-to-back -back cloudy days. Always bring your cords with you to charge your power stations and then take them into a cafe, a library, or a laundry mat. Oh, you guys, another one. I just think memorials are beautiful. Our loved ones touch our life and even whenever they move on to the next whatever, we think of them, we love them, and we honor them. And I think that's beautiful. Two, shuffling and simplicity versus asceticism. Asceticism defined, severe self-denial or severe self-discipline. One of the main reasons I moved into my car is that I wanted a simpler life. Now, life is far more simple than it was prior to living in the car. However, everything sort of has a midpoint and a sweet spot, and living in a car almost moves a little bit into the realm of asceticism. You can only take so much in your vehicle, and truly there are things that you may want or need that don't fit. In my quest for simplicity, it's for simplicity and ease and flow of life. It isn't for deprivation purposes. I found that I did have to sacrifice quite a few things that would have made ease of life flow a little bit more smoothly. For example, I can only take five gallons of water with me at a given time. So that means that I always need within every couple of days to be near a place to fill up my water because you never want to risk being without water. Living out of your car, you don't have sort of main amenities of life always set up for you. What I'm thinking of right now is a kitchen. Every time I want to cook something or heat up some water, you have to pull out something to set your stove on. You got to pull out your stove and pull out the butane every single time. I found that I cook far, far less, which is actually okay because I never loved cooking. To make a fish, it takes like, I don't know, five to 10 minutes to just pull out what you need to make the fish, plus the time to cook the fish. And then cleaning is a little bit more tricky. You don't have a sink where you can just sort of with ease wash your dishes. You've got to use vinegar and a paper towel. And... It's just a little trickier. Is it worth it? Yes. What's the solution? The solution could be an upgraded vehicle, which I don't want to do yet. Whatever next vehicle I get, will have a place where the kitchen setup is right there, ready to go. I always wonder how weird it looks when I'm just talking to my camera and people can see me. I'm a little shy about that still. Oh well, just gotta, just gotta do it, right? Yeah, I'm not doing this live for deprivation. I'm doing it for simplicity. In living in the car, there's enough that's making it work for me right now to continue to do this lifestyle, even though I do feel like I crossed that wonderful threshold of simplicity into the asceticism zone. Now, the reason it's worth it is the gas. I get the best gas mileage ever. I love the stealth factor. And because I own my car free and clear, my financial life is such right now that I have more time than I ever have because I really shifted how I work. I, so I have more time. I'm able to save a lot more money. Whenever I think of like, okay, I'm living a bit like an ascetic right now and that was not my goal. <laughs> well, it gave me more time. In terms of shuffling, setting up your tents take time, even with my awesome pop-up tents, which you may have seen from previous videos. Here's a few clips of how awesome and easy they are to set up. So easy and a breakdown. down. 
and it's still kind of a pain in the bootay to have those tents. I honestly barely use them. I put them up the other day because I'm like, I'm going to be at this campsite for at least three days. Wind blew them practically away. Yeah, I'm glad I caught them before the wind blew them to where they were unsalvageable. I primarily use my tiny little TV tray because that's the easiest thing to pull out and set up in like, I don't know, 20 seconds. If you want to set up your whole table and break it down, that takes too long. So a couple of solutions that I have for this is my awesome, very flat platform that I built in my passenger seat area. And I have also turned my fridge to where it's a little bit of counter space because counter space is so important. I do have that folding table, but because it takes so long to break down and set up, I barely use that too. And then sometimes there's just a lot more work over things that you probably never thought of doing before, especially if you weren't a huge camper prior to this lifestyle. So for example, if it starts to rain and I just need to pack up and go prior to the rain water drying off of my tent and my tarp, if you pack all of that up, you have to let it expose out to dry. Otherwise you're risking mold and mildew and ruining your tent. Part of the shuffling frustration is that other things that like especially if you're staying with friends or doing multiple pet sitting or staying with family things that have to come in and out of your car all the time items of clothing your toiletries any items you need from work such as your laptop for me my hot spot food especially i try to do my best to eat healthy plus i don't like to eat who I'm working for out of house and home. Sometimes I do and I always replace the ice cream, but I do like to bring in my own food. So that means carton in my refrigerator. <laughs> so much shuffling. And when you're not in your car for a long period of time, it kind of feels like you're constantly moving. So the solution to that A is acceptance. And as I get really frustrated with something along those lines, what I tell myself is, hmm, is it worth anywhere between 1100 to 2000 plus a month in all the time lost to work and pay for an apartment? No. Is it worth that same cost to pay for a mortgage when that means I'm stuck in one location? No. It's a little bit like suck it up buttercup which I kind of like that tough pull yourself up by the bootstrap. We all got to pick our poison in this life. I pick the poison of having annoying things to shuffle on a regular basis and just cursing in the process and venting and getting it out and then having an amazing life with far more time and far more work freedom. Okay, so besides the perspective of acceptance, another solution for those things, always just have a clothing and toiletry bag you can easily grab, take in and out less work. If you sort of plan properly and set things up appropriately, it creates less work for you as you're shuffling and moving in and out of things. Continuing on the theme of the challenge with shuffling. This is so beautiful, you guys. I just had to take a moment. I just moved and I parked somewhere. I gotta show you how pretty this is. On the note of shuffling being Tricky, if you want to add anything small to your car, like baking soda. I wanted to bring in some baking soda, but I'm like, where am I going to put it? So every inch of space is incredibly valuable. Every time you bring something in, you have more stuff to shuffle. All right, so the solution to this, don't bring as much stuff in. It requires living unbelievably simply. It brings an intention and an awareness to what you purchase, what you buy, and what you choose to keep in your car. I chose to pass on the baking soda. I can go buy some if I need it. 
and it's not worth the space to take just in case. There ain't no room for backstock of unnecessary items in your car, unless you just want to live in clutter. Three, daylight dictates your routine. The third thing that is challenging about living in your car is that you have to flow with the season. Everything from the climate, but to the light. So in some ways, that's actually really cool. I sleep so much more in the winter and I sleep less in the summer and I like that my body is flowing with the natural seasons more than they ever have. But oh boy, did I never realize how dependent we are on artificial light until I moved into my vehicle. So there are multiple things that you need to do while you still have daylight. And the first and most important thing to do while you still have daylight is know where you're gonna sleep. When you're asleep, you're super vulnerable. So you wanna make sure you're in a very safe location. If you're stealth camping in a city, you will have needed to scope out that area. You definitely need to get a feel for it and you also need to know the escape route. You can't necessarily assess that very well in the dark. If you're camping in national forest or BLM land, you absolutely need to show up there before it's dark because a, you might drive into a big rock you don't see. You might drive into a ditch. You could drive off of a cliff. So try not to get into natural wilderness areas when it's like really dark. And you definitely wanna be able to assess the vibe of your neighbors, you know? These are all things that you need to do while it's still daylight out. And when it starts to get dark around like 4.30, 5 o'clock, you lose day pretty quickly. I like to prep my tea at night. I have two giant thermoses that are excellent. They keep it super like piping hot all throughout the night and then the MIT is ready for me to go. I'm looking for a better boiling system because it takes me like half an hour to heat my two thermoses. Now they're huge. This is my thermos. I drink two of those of tea every single day. I like my caffeine. I gave up coffee for this lifestyle. I'm keeping the tea. It's kind of a pain to do that whenever it's dark outside. I just don't enjoy it. I'll do it because I'm that addicted to caffeine, but I don't enjoy it. Other things you need to do while it's still light outside. If you're in bear country especially, you need to make sure that anything with food scent around your vehicle or campsite is safely put away, put up in a tree. You need to be able to do those things while it's still light outside. So same thing even if it's not bear country, but there's like potentially raccoons or other even like javelina or something who might come get your trash. Because I'll tell you what, even though some little critters are not dangerous, their predators are dangerous. You don't want to be attracting animals to your site, to your car. You want to be keeping those predators away from you. If you need to put something back into your car that you had outside, it's ideal to do that while it's still light because if you put stuff back in your car, not in its home that you have used for organization, your car is going to become a disaster so fast. Putting things back in their home keeps your sanity by keeping it organized and then you know where it is. You gotta put on your window covers. I black out every single window in my vehicle and I like to be able to put those up when it's still light out. Sometimes, especially as fall morphs closer and closer to the solstice and then we're in the heart of winter and it's dark early, it can be tricky. It feels like you've got a very short amount of daylight because you do and you've got to plan your life accordingly and be flexible in ways that you didn't have to be flexible whenever you could just click on an artificial light. That was a big surprise to me. All in all, I really do like flowing with the seasons. I like that my body is acclimating and getting far more used to doing what the animal body does, which is morph to its environment. At the same time, I'm still adjusting. Maybe by next year, I'll be a little bit better at this. I'm a few hours in the future, but I realized that earlier when I was talking about things you need to do before you get ready for bed, you gotta brush your teeth. I usually brush my teeth right either in or outside my car with tap water and I spit into a Ziploc bag. Even if I'm out in the middle of nature, I don't like spitting my toothpaste onto mother nature. So I spit in the Ziploc bag, I throw it in the appropriate place. That's just another thing you gotta think about as you're getting ready for bed and you don't necessarily have to do that when it's light. It's just easier to do when it's light. Four, remote work challenges. If you work remotely, this section is for you. The fourth thing that is difficult about living in your car if you work remotely, 
and you are required to have constant internet access, you're going to need to be where you're within your hotspot service range. If you have Starlink, you're gonna to have to set up that Starlink every single time you're ready for work. You have to make sure that your power stations are sufficiently charged. Otherwise your laptop's gonna run out of juice, your cell phone, your iPad, and that is not good. It makes you not a reliable employee. That means you're dependent on sunshine. That means you're dependent on your 12 volt outlets working in your car, which one of mine just went out. I have to figure out what the heck. If you're working remotely in remote locations, your internet might be spotty. So again, thinking of like reliability factors, you might just need to pay a little bit of extra attention to that in a way that can be kind of frustrating sometimes, especially if you think you found a location where you're like, oh, the internet's great. And then halfway through a call, internet drops. Not cool, it happens. I sort of talked about this earlier in the video when we were talking about temperature, but if your work is confidential and you have to work from inside your car, well, it can get really hot. And that means you can't necessarily work in cafes and whatnot. A solution to this, do work that's not confidential. Okay, I'm getting really tired and really hungry. So I'm gonna go eat and rest, and then I will catch you a little bit later for the remainder of this video. So the wind picked up, but the sun is out. So I got back to my campsite early enough to start setting some things up. So see, got my water thing going in my car right here is blocking the wind because the wind is coming from the northwest so got my car blocking that over here is my fridge that's just chilling right over here i got my jacket i don't know that it's like taking in anything it's taking in 45 watts because the sun is getting low check out that cool rock formation behind me that's really cool where we last left off i was talking about confidential work and how you can roast out of your car confidential work is okay in the wind or the rain or the freezing cold like that ain't too bad i don't mind working from my car in the winter well except for when it's like three degrees and then the jackery won't work because it has some auto safe to turn off so this is where you can't be in too cold of weather whenever it is basically 32 to say like 50 degrees it's a really pleasant work environment inside your vehicle Whenever you are above about 65, for me, that's when it starts to get hot. Five, other people's judgment. Another thing you'll encounter that can be challenging when you live in your car is other people's judgment. Now, I wanna distinguish this from legitimate concern from loved ones. When you tell your loved ones, especially if they're more traditional, y'all, if you tell your loved ones, guess what I'm gonna do? Hey, hey. <laughs> oh my goodness. You know, my parents were not actually surprised because I have been talking about wanting to live nomadically since I was 17 years old. When I actually talked to them and said, okay, you know what, I have to do this. If I don't, I will regret it. My mom, who loves me and wants me safe, she was like, yep, that sounds about right. If you don't do this, you will never know and you will regret if you don't do this. My father was still like, you really want it? Really? Why are you doing this? He loves me and he's concerned. And so here's what's really important. When your loved ones express their concern, listen to them. What I did with my mom and with my dad is I said, let's talk about every single safety scenario that you can think of and let's come up with a way to troubleshoot it. What an incredible blessing to have family that loves you and wants you safe. Such a gift. So I just want to distinguish concern from judgment. Judgment is haters, whether online or offline, who are like, what, you gonna be homeless? <laughs> or like, I don't like when people tell me you should get a van. I don't mind if people ask me, why don't you have a van? And they're curious, I just don't. 
It's just annoying when people judge you and telling you what to do. But a van gets like three times less the gas mileage. My car gets like 32 miles to a gallon on the freeway. A van gets like 12 miles to a gallon. Some vans get like 17 and that's better. All that being said, the real gift about this particular challenge is so much is within your control. Things might bug you, it's natural they might bug you, but you have the capacity to A, trust your spirit, B, trust yourself. It's not that you disconnect and just don't care what people think because if you really do that, you might be sociopathic. So we're social creatures. We are supposed to care what other people think. It's what keeps social order. And for those who don't, they commit atrocious crime, atrocious crimes. Caring what people think to a degree, and notice how tiny this is, is helpful. But if people be hating up on your dreams and you're letting their perception get to you, you got to let that go. If you're trying to control their perception, dang, that is hard to say. If you are trying to control their perception, <laughs> you know why that's hard to say? because it's getting cold out. And when it's cold out, it's hard to talk. When you allow someone else's perception to take up your attention span and then you attempt to alter that, you actually become controlling in the process. So you gotta drop it. Again, natural to care, but you gotta say, you know what? I get it. You may never understand. If you have legitimate questions, that's cool. I'll answer them. If you have legitimate concerns, let's talk through them and then it comes down to, okay, we may just have to agree to disagree. Now, a lot of times really judgy people don't like to agree to disagree. So then you just have to be on your way. And that's okay. That's okay. Because one of the gifts about the philosophy of car life is that you are freeing yourself. This is a life of freedom. You don't want to be tethered to judgments. You don't want to be tethered to power dynamics and control. You want to love people, care for people, then drop it. But here's something else that is just hard about being in a car is everybody's like, what about your safety? Some people are obsessed with telling you how unsafe this is. Let me tell you something for all my ladies out there. Let me preface this by saying you absolutely want to have self-defense. You want to have a weapon that you want to be prepared to use it mentally. You want to physically be keen at your capacity to use it. You want to do tons of research about safety. You can even watch my safety video and read all the comments because people added stuff that is such good information. You want to know the most dangerous place for a woman? The research has shown that the majority of women who are killed are killed in the home. The majority of women who are raped are raped by someone they know. That is not to minimize the need to be cautious, the need to protect, and the need to be safe out and about but the degree of concern about safety that people have compared to the reality, it just doesn't line up. Safety is so important, but see, I believe this lifestyle is far more safe in many ways. You're constantly on the move. You barely have anything. So yeah, if somebody steals stuff, it sucks. You don't want your stuff stolen, but it's not the end of the world. You go buy new stuff because you barely have stuff and you're able to save enough money doing this life that it's okay to replace things. Some people might get judgy about this being irresponsible. I believe we have a, the utmost responsibility to live a life well lived. I believe it would be irresponsible even if the world, society, looked at your life and said, oh, what a professional. Ah, oh, what a good, you know, counselor, director, or writer, or whatever. But you were unhappy and you didn't have the courage to follow and pursue your dreams, I think that would be irresponsible. Even some of my mentors who I just value the heck out of their opinion, I assume they might think this is irresponsible. I can't know because these are like mentors who are authors in books <laughs> or on YouTube. I assume they might think this is irresponsible and maybe they would, but that's okay. See, that's something else that you have to untie yourself from the judgment and perceptions of others, even when you genuinely respect them. If it's your calling, you've got to do it. And you define what responsibility means. Are you taking from others? Because I, I don't think we should be taken. Are you contributing? Are you leaving a light footprint? Are you pursuing your dreams? Are you helping others? Are you of service? These are all things that I think is like 
you know, how to have responsibility. Six, ergonomics and structural health issues. And number six, one of the things that can be hard about this lifestyle are ergonomics. So I have a funny story. So you know, I told you I'm a writer. I write for sometimes random psychology publications. And I happened to have an article that I was writing on ergonomics. And let me show you how I was sitting. I was sitting right here with my knees to the side like this on my mattress, hunched in. And then I was typing right on my platform. I pretty much was like this as I'm like, it's really important to have good equal posture, balanced posture. <laughs> so that was hypocritical. And it was a good lesson. It was a blessing because this extra piece to my platform has also become like a standing desk. It is exactly the right size for me to have my laptop and to stand with very good posture and type away. And if I'm in a secluded enough location, I can even do quiet sessions from right here, standing up. Ergonomics are important, and they're important not just whenever you're working, they're important when you're getting in and out of your vehicle. I'm about to lose light. Let's see if I can do this before the light goes away. Disclaimer, I'm not an osteopath, is that what they're called? I'm not a massage therapist, and I am not a physical therapist, but I have worked with all of them. And this is the advice that they've given me, but I'm not, this is not medical advice. This is what I do. You want to keep your knees together as often as possible. You want to basically get in where your body is in alignment as much as possible. See? And then when you're sleeping and you need to get up, you want to bring your knees up to your chest, roll to the side, both legs together, and then come out. I want to show you the same thing. When you're getting in and out of your driver's seat, I had an osteopath tell me that this is like one of the most important things he tells all his clients. When getting in and out of the car, you want to sit knees together, lift in knees together, around knees together, drive away, getting out of the car, swing out knees together, stand up knees together. Apparently what that does is A, it keeps your hip in alignment, it stops your back from acting all weird, and so as much as possible, that's how you want to move around. With your knees together, to the side, and then up. So those are six hard things about living in your car. Solutions to every single one of them. So if you have a solution to any of these problems that I have not mentioned in this video, I do hope you'll share in the comments. Lastly, several things you'll note that were not on my list. Go into the bathroom. I got that down. Showering. That was a huge concern before I embarked on this life. Seriously, not that big of a deal. And searching for a spot each night. Thought that would be really stressful. It's just not. Just takes a little bit of advanced research. And that's the thing about a car. It is easy to stealth in places. And nobody suspects you're in there. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you later. Thanks for watching. To follow my adventures, as well as to get more car life tips, tricks, and nomadic philosophy, like, comment, turn on that notification bell, and subscribe.